I want to start this session by reading a line from President Obama's weekly radio address that celebrates the administration's big win in King v. Burwell. For the maybe three of you who don't know, that's the Supreme Court case that challenged the availability of tax subsidies in states using the Federal Health Exchange. And the president said this weekend, with this case behind us, we're going to keep working to make healthcare in America even better and more affordable and to get more people covered. But it is time to stop refighting battles that have been settled again and again. It's time to move on. First of all, I suspect that's kind of wishful thinking on the president's part. Second, before we move on, I think it's worth spending at least a little time reviewing how we got here. We are joined by two panelists who are both extremely knowledgeable on this topic, although in somewhat different ways. Nancy Ann DeParle, on the far right, got the ultimate insider look at how the ACA went from an idea to a bill to a law. The administrator of Medicare and Medicaid under President Clinton, who began her career in healthcare in Tennessee in the early 1990s, Nancy Ann joined the Obama administration in early 2009 as the president's healthcare advisor. She eventually rose to become the president's deputy chief of staff before decamping back to the private sector in 2013. That gave her a front row seat to the passage and early implementation of the law. Stephen Brill, meanwhile, right here, uh, has made his mark mostly in what I like to call entrepreneurial journalism. Back in the 1980s, when I was a cub reporter at Legal Times, I was 12, really, uh, <laughs> he was running our socks off at his then groundbreaking American Lawyer magazine. He went on to found Court TV, among other enterprises, broke into healthcare reporting in 2013 with a special report published in Time magazine called Bitter Pill, Why Medical Bills Are Killing Us. He expanded that into a book, America's Bitter Pill, published this past January, delayed only slightly by his own up close and personal run in with the healthcare system. Uh, the book details the story of how the Affordable Care Act progressed into a law, at least the version participants were willing to offer him. So here's how we'll proceed. I'm going to start with a question for each of our panelists. The three of us will chat for maybe a half an hour. Then I will open the floor up for your questions. Please wait for a microphone to get to you. We are taping this. And please give us your name before you ask your question so we'll know who we're talking to. So let's begin. I think we have to start with the news, obviously, the Supreme Court ruling that most pundits say cements the ACA into the fabric of American life. Do you believe that that's the case, or could politics or something else continue to make this law a question mark? Yeah. Well, uh, like the president, I'm guilty of being an optimist, uh, which is uh, how I got there to the White House working on health reform after having also worked on it in the Clinton administration. So yes, I do believe that uh, the Supreme Court's decision uh, and in such a strong fashion, the Chief Justice's uh, wording about the the law was intended to strengthen insurance markets, not to destroy them. The combination of that and the fact that uh, I think the evidence is there, the facts are there that the law is working, does mean that it is now cemented and will take its place alongside uh, Medicare and Medicaid that we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of right now. Do you think we're done with the perils of Pauline or could it come back? I think we're done in terms of the law. I think the controversy will go on and Frankly, I blame the press for that as much as I blame um, the Republicans. Um, pretty much all of the press, just to give you an example, treated the issue in the King v. Burwell case, you included, as a, as a matter of on the one hand, on the other hand. And I think that journalists make a big mistake when they take facts, not opinions, facts and attach a false equivalency to them. There isn't a single Republican involved in drafting the law. And this I found out uh, before this was the case because I was talking to these people when they were writing the bill. There isn't a single Republican involved in drafting the law, not a one who thought in any way, shape, or form that states that did not set up their own exchanges would not have their citizens get the subsidies. In fact, when the case was first filed in district court, I asked uh, someone uh, who I'm very close to, who's a lawyer, a very experienced lawyer, has some Supreme Court experience. I sent the case to her and said, what about this? This looks like something. And she wrote back, she said, if you spend five minutes on this, you are wasting your time. There isn't a single federal judge who will even look at this case. It is just bullshit. And Obviously, she was wrong, but that doesn't mean uh, the press ought to have treated it incessantly as in this side claims 
Congress meant this, this side claims Congress meant to do this. It was just a fiction. So coming to where we are today, you hear uh, these press conferences, and I know I sound like you know, I'm a press spokesman for uh, the Affordable Care Act, and if you read my book, you'll know that I'm not. But you see uh, Republican press releases, uh, uh, House Speaker Boehner, for example, saying the Affordable Care Act is going to continue to drive up costs for all Americans. There's nothing in the Affordable Care Act that raises insurance premiums. In fact, there's a lot in it uh, that is supposed to keep them under control and lower. It doesn't really do that either. But uh, so we now are having a debate about um, this is just too expensive for the average American. The average American is totally unaffected by the Affordable Care Act. The average American has insurance from their employer, will keep insurance from their employer, and the fact that those costs are going up has to do with the fact that those costs have been going up since 1970. Dr. Oh, go ahead. I, I would disagree a little bit with what um, but the last point you made, Stephen, and as the only non-journalist on this panel, I'm not going to attack the press. In fact, Julie, I'd like to thank you for, uh, I'll date both of us here a little bit, the decades you spent covering healthcare in such a balanced way. And every one of those thousands of meetings I had on Capitol Hill, when I came out, no matter what time of day or night it was, um, Julie was one of the people sitting in the hallway or coming up to ask a question. So uh, that was important work to um, inform the people. But Stephen, you, you just made the point that um, the, the average American isn't really affected by this law. And I would disagree a little bit because um, everyone sitting in this room now has insurance coverage uh, that can't have an annual limit or, uh, and you have a cap on your out-of-pocket costs and you have uh, preventive benefits, 75 million Americans who didn't have those before. Most of the people in this room probably already had preventive benefits under their plans, but no, you're right. 75 I'm million Americans didn't have them. Um, 100 million Americans who have pre-existing conditions, uh, which I dare say includes most of us in this room, could now leave our jobs, get a different job, and still have coverage that protected us. And for those of us who are women, uh, there are a number of states in this country, including some around here, uh, where you would be charged more, significantly more, just because you're a woman. Um, and that can't happen. So uh, I think those are benefits sure. no, that you're help You're absolutely right. I stand corrected. Americans. What I meant was that the average family's costs have not gone up. The average family, with the kind of insurance you're describing, the typical insurance, has benefited um, enormously from the law. You're absolutely right. And, I, and I, before we move on, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative on the media coverage of this, which I have been among those who said has been not very good. But I will say on King v. Burwell, I did my first King v. Burwell story when it was still, I think even before it was how big, it was right after the Supreme Court ruled in 2012. Um, I did a story that there's this, you know, case wandering around, it's been <laughs> filed, and, you know, I interviewed Michael Cannon, who'd been pushing it, and who, of course, was the person who'd gone to all those states, those 34 states, and said, no, don't set up your own exchange. Um, so it it was sort of his, his, in part, his fault that there wasn't, uh, that there were so many states in the federal exchange. Um, but one of the things, we talked a little bit about false equivalence last night um, at the media panel, for those of you who were there. I think when it, and I think people were pretty good about not writing about it until there was a district court opinion and then an appeals court opinion and then the Supreme Court took it. Once it was before the Supreme Court, it was obviously news, but in getting to the false equivalence point, a lot of reporters, including me, including Jonathan Cohn, who's now at the Huffington Post, um, who were there, as Nancy Ann said, during the writing of this and had never heard word one from anyone about any possibility that tax credits wouldn't be available everywhere, um, were quick to sort of jump out of our usual, I'm just reporting the facts, to say, really, we were there, we never saw this. It's uncomfortable sometimes as a reporter, but occasionally you have to just say, uh, you know, this this is not what happened. This whether what the legal, you know, what the Supreme Court did or didn't decide to do was not our problem, but at least as people who were there and covering it, I noticed a number of us, you know, stand up to say this was not what we saw. Well, okay, I will just <laughs> say that I'm a bit of a skeptic about um, the coverage, and, and part of that is colored by the experience of the summer of 2013, by which time uh, Nancy Ann, lucky for her, had, had flown the coop. And um, there, were, there were all these stories. I thought you were going to thank me for my service. There were all, <laughs> thank you for your service. 
Thank you for your service. Uh, there were all these stories in June and July and August about the drama of the launch of Obamacare. What was the drama? The drama was could the old political team, the people who had elected the president in 2008 and 2012, could the old band get back together and using their micro-targeting and all their, all, uh, their demographic projections and all their campaign tricks, get everybody to enroll? There was a memorable story uh, that Sarah Cliff, who is otherwise the single best reporter covering healthcare on the planet, uh, co-offered uh, with Ezra Klein, I guess it was his fault, um, that had a picture of this guy, David Seamus, who was portrayed as a god. He, I think, was an intern uh, for David Axelrod in 2008. And he's looking, peering out from the White House, and he's the guy in charge of you know, targeting this precinct in Houston and this precinct there. And the whole drama is, can the old gang get everybody to do one more thing, which is come to the website and enroll in Obamacare? And I will tell you that by then, it would have been crystal clear to any reporter who was just asking around that the issue wasn't whether people would come to the website. The issue was what was going to happen when they got there. <laughs> and we know what happened when they got there. Well, we'll get to that in a minute, but I want to go a little bit backwards first. Um, yesterday, in this very room, uh, in the panel talking about the Supreme Court decision, former Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist said that the law, while it has good things in it, is basically fatally flawed because it was passed with only Democratic votes, which it was. Believe me, I know more than most how hard everyone tried to get Republicans. I spent literally weeks camped outside those closed meetings that Senator Baucus was holding with Republican Senators Grassley, Hatch, Enzi, and Snow. Um, can you both address that? How many that? on the record interviews did you do then? Oh, How many, many people did you quote by name? Most about of them. What, what the issues were that they were bargaining over? Um, many the of specific them. Specific issues they were bargaining over. To the extent they would tell us. That's why we were sitting outside okay. the office. You, have, you clearly haven't read all of my reporting. They came out, they talked, they didn't say a whole lot, but yeah. Some of them did, though. Some, some of, of them, them, yes, some yeah. of them did. They frequently were talking about yeah. what they were talking about. And if we laid out the 900 pages of the bill here and went through them, um, I could point out hundreds of ideas that they contributed to the bills. Um, in fact, I used to tease the president that some of them who will be unnamed um, had a lot more in the bill than he did of their ideas. Because, and they were good ideas, things that actually, Stephen, you and I agree on, like, yeah. like uh, more transparency for um, hospital charges and those kinds of things. Senator Grassley that was pushed Senator that. Senator Grassley who right. pushed that in. And he, I thought it was a good idea. And I went to the president. He said, that's a great idea. Let's put it in there. So they had a lot of um, contributions to make. Um, you know, I, I, uh, we didn't write this bill. And one reason we didn't is because the president wanted it to be bipartisan. He wanted to have um, everyone at the table. And so when I got to the White House, I typed out a quote from President Johnson, which was, uh, there is but one way for a president to deal with the Congress, and that is uh, continuously, incessantly, and without interruption. And that's what we tried to do. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's one of my biggest regrets that in the end, um, a group of them couldn't come over and be part of it, because I think uh, it would have made Secretary Sebelius's job much easier. It would have been easier to get the funding that we needed at various points. Um, yeah, that's it would a have been bum much rap. easier. I mean, these guys really got a bum rap for that. They were, um, you basically were, you know, were living with Olympia Snow at the time. I mean, she, <laughs> when I interviewed Olivia Snow, she told me more about you than, than, than your close friends who told me about you in terms of your <laughs> biography and everything. You two Maybe bonded. I don't have any close friends. Uh, no, you have close. Um, but uh, that's really a bum rap. And in fact, um, it sort of goes back to um, inauguration night. 2009, uh, when Frank Luntz, um, who's a Republican um, operative, I'm an upholster, also a pretty good friend of mine, has a dinner in Washington for a bunch of Republican congressmen and pollsters. And um, the topic of the dinner is how do we block the new president? And topic A wasn't uh, the stimulus stuff because they knew they were going to have to pass the stimulus bill. Topic A was we have to stop health care reform because if the Democrats do this, 
Um, it will end up like Social Security and Medicare. It'll be part of their legacy. We have to stop that. And one of the problems, and again, you know, I don't think um, uh, the American people really realize this, although uh, certainly Senator Daschle emphasized this yesterday, you emphasized this, is what the Democrats basically decided to do with Obamacare was say yes to the Republicans. And the Republicans couldn't take yes for an answer. The law on the books is a slightly more conservative version of something Richard Nixon proposed in the 1970s to block a Teddy Kennedy proposal. And it's a much more conservative in terms of the subsidies and a, I mean, a bunch of other things, um, um, a lot of other provisions. It's much more conservative than what Mitt Romney did in Massachusetts. So the Democrats said, okay, we'll do this. And at that dinner, um, in anticipation that they were hearing none of it, and they literally discussed, well, we'll have a bunch of Republicans sort of play along for a while. They talked about this. And then they'll gradually drop off, and then at the end, the final ones will drop off and they say, this is just too unreasonable. The president and his staff are just being too unreasonable. It's their way or the highway, and we just can't agree with it. And that's exactly what happened. The last one uh, was Senator Grassley, who kept you guys going for months, but there was, um, actually, um, Olympia Snow hung on until the very end, too. But um, they walked away. And uh, not because the Democrats weren't trying. Again, this was a Republican bill. Just think about it. Um, the reason it passed was every single industry in healthcare benefited from this bill. The pharmaceutical companies, God knows they benefited. The insurance companies, the hospitals, the nonprofit hospitals benefited, the for profit hospitals benefited. Uh, the medical device makers, everybody got all these new customers who were going to be paid for by the government uh, through their subsidies for health care. But the Republicans just couldn't take yes for an answer. I think a big part of the problem going forward now, and we've talked a little bit about polls back and forth, and um, I, I think you know most people don't know what's in the law, so they only know whether they like it or don't like it based on its title. Um, we could spend a whole hour on why that is, but let me ask it this way. What do you, each of you think is the single most misunderstood thing about what is or isn't in the Affordable Care Act? Well, two. Can I have two, Julie? Sure. I'll be quick. <laughs> so one is, uh, that it's a government takeover, because I continue to hear that. And it's a little bit like, I don't know if uh, Congressman Waxman is still here, but he it's made right the point yesterday right here. Here. about people say, don't take away my Medicare, and I don't want this government thing. They don't understand that the government's really involved in it. Um, so that's one thing. Um, it isn't a government takeover. It's far from it. I don't know if I would go as far as Stephen did in characterizing it uh, as a, a Nixonian uh, or more conservative than Nixon, well, but it certainly was it built is. on, <laughs> it was certainly, no, I have a lot of respect for him. It was built <laughs> on the private sector, yeah. uh, and it was, it was a lot of ideas that had been worked on on a bipartisan basis in the wake of the failure of the Clinton health plan. And so uh, to, to call it that is, is not right. And secondly, um, th there continues to be a hue and cry about it doesn't do enough to bring down costs. And starting with the fact that uh, we decided that this law, we, with the Congress, decided this law had to be uh, bring down the deficit, lower health care costs. Uh, one of the most unpleasant meetings I had in, a, in four years of some pretty unpleasant meetings was one of my first ones, and you'll remember this, Henry, coming up to the Congress, the leaders in the House, um, Mr. Waxman, Speaker Pelosi, um, Mr. Rangel, and telling them that based on the estimates that we had done, we couldn't afford to do a bill that had um, the same coverage that members of Congress had, that it would be too expensive, that based on our earliest estimates, we just couldn't afford that. We had to be able to pay for it. We didn't think we'd do that. It's very unpleasant. We, you know, it's, it just wasn't um, the Cadillac that some people think. It actually has done a lot to lower health care costs. Well, as I recall, the most unpleasant uh, byplay you had with Mr. Waxman and others on the House side, the Democratic side, was when, and there's a whole series of emails that go back and forth with you and them and, and with uh, the farmer people who you were in contact with, when you had to tell them that, um, no, you weren't going to do something to control uh, the price of drugs, no, you weren't going to act on uh, Medicare being able to negotiate uh, the price of drugs, and that is, you know, 
that's why Big Pharma supported the bill, and that's why Congressman Waxman wasn't exactly doing handstands when he read the final draft, <laughs> if I'm speaking correctly. I think I am. The, uh, the biggest um, unknowns in the bill, one of them is in part the fault of uh, the Obama administration. Um, after the summer of 2009, uh, the Tea Party summer when everybody was going berserk and, and Senator Grassley goes back to his district and there are all these demonstrations about Obamacare and death panels, you remember all that. Um, by uh, the time it gets to be the 2012 re-election campaign, the Obama administration doesn't want anything to do with this law that they got passed in um, March of 2010. And because they, you know, they'd lost the Congress, uh, they'd lost the House in 2010, so they freeze all the writing of regulations and all that stuff, which is one of the reasons that the launch was such a disaster. But the other thing they do, their messaging, um, is not the reality, which is, hey, all you uh, middle class and lower middle class people out there, you're getting a subsidy, a really significant subsidy to buy health insurance. And that was never the message. The message was this is insurance reform, which is a really good political message, and it's an accurate one. You know, the insurance companies can't kick you off. Um, they have to give you certain kinds of preventive care. But the real sales pitch, and to this day, most people don't know it. Um, there are polls, I think, uh, that Sarah, uh, you've written about them, uh, other polls that show a large number of people who have signed up and are getting the subsidies and who might be paying, let's say, $250 or $300 a month for insurance, they think that's the cost of their insurance. They don't even know that the government is chipping in another $600 for them. That's a pretty good thing politically. The one thing that would have happened if the Supreme Court decision had gone the other way is everybody would have realized that provision was there because <laughs> it would have gone away. Um, well, but I'll, that, I'll I think take was, that and we can do a better job. I, I, I mean, agree we can do a better job at communicating it. But, but that uh, was the more deliberate. It wasn't just me, a bad job. It was deliberate. It was, I don't remember it that way at all, hmm. Stephen. Uh, freezing regulations. I don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what I'm talking about? No. Okay, I, just, I was sitting here thinking. In the normal I, course of business, it takes time. three years to do regulations that... that um, for example, the Grassley regulations about you know hospitals. Um, well, it depends on the agency. Some of medicine. them take as much okay, as six let's years. Let's not fight about it. But the period when when I was at the White House, we put out probably a dozen major regulations in less than six months. Things that were reforming the insurance markets, the um, allowing children to stay on your parents' plan until you're age 26. The two things you put out. By, the two things you put out within six months, actually six and a half months. Were the medical loss ratio policy? No, the medical the loss ratio policy took a year and a half to put the final reg out. You're just wrong. Um, the, uh, the kids, uh, the 26 and under kids wrong. took six and a half months. It was, no, it actually took six months. Well, there were a host of deadlines in the law that we met, and you can look at the GAO reports on that. And medical loss ratio, uh, if you'll recall, what was built into the law was are working with the okay, National well, the Association. Go. Can you let me finish? The National Association of Insurance Commissioners. So they worked on the initial definitions that would go into the medical loss ratio policy, and then we put it forward. Okay. But I think we did them really quickly. And on that one in particular, um, Americans have saved $9 billion to date from the requirement about medical loss ratios. I think so, the ones that notably got delayed had to do with the exchanges. They kept yeah, moving the exchange all the rules date. About the exchanges. Right. But, and I think part of that was not so much for political reasons. I mean, they, it was for political reasons, but different political reasons. It was to see what happened in the election if there would be different governors who would make different decisions about whether or not they were going to participate. And a lot of the time was spent trying to get governors to agree to do their own exchanges. Those deadlines kept being pushed out because, you know, there was a desire to get governors to agree to do it. Yeah. Well, let's, let's look forward a little bit. Um, whether, whether or not the ACA is here to stay, I think just about everybody agrees that more needs to be done when it comes to health care reform. Uh, former Majority Leader Daschle pointed out yesterday that there actually has been some bipartisanship on health care this year. Congress addressed the SGR, the Medicare doctor fee problem. Uh, there's a 21st century cures bill that is, is now sort of moving its way forward. What needs to happen before Republicans and, and Democrats can work together on the list that you talked about yesterday of technical corrections? Well, um, you know, we, 
I think now that we've begun to address the problems that were there when the president took office, the 51 million uninsured and growing, the um, healthcare cost growth that was unsustainable, the uh, fact that our quality was very checkered at best and we were not getting uh, a return on investment for that. So now that we've dealt with those problems or beginning to deal with them, we can move on to really figuring out what's the next level of reforms that might be needed. Um, cost containment in healthcare uh, is like you know me and my diet or something. It's not something you can do one time. You have to you have to keep being diligent about it. And so you know people desire healthcare services, and it's great. Look at all the things across the hall Mayo's doing. You know I want all of that. So how do we design it in such a way that consumers can get the information they need about what works, what doesn't work, um, become more um, you know use healthcare in a more cost-effective way? And then Stephen alluded to communications problems, and there's some really interesting projects going on. I see my friend Diane Archer here who's working on some projects about how you engage consumers um, in the way, meet them where they are and help them to understand um, healthful living and how they can uh, use healthcare more um, efficiently and effectively. So those are things we need to do. I think one of the problems we, we face, and we don't, it, it's sort of something that we don't talk about much, is that if I give a speech of if Congressman Waxman gives a speech that says um, health care is eating up one-sixth of our economy, it's on its way to being 20 percent of the GDP, we have to cut that. And everybody in this room says, well, that's a great idea. I mean, why should we spend 18 or 19 or 20 percent of our GDP when France has a better health care system and spends 10 or 11 percent? Everybody likes that, except when you slice away that GDP, you're slicing away people's jobs. And a lot of people's jobs, and for example, well, not every, necessarily their jobs, but their incomes. Well, their jobs too. If they're, you know, if there are too many MRIs being given out, that means there are too many MRI salesmen and too many MRI technicians, and that cuts right to real people with real incomes, and most important, real companies with real lobbyists. So, uh, you know, let's take hospitals. So. You know, suppose you say hospitals are making too much money or hospitals ought to consolidate. It's a complete waste of money that this hospital's here and this hospital's here. And that's great, except every congressman has at least one hospital probably in his district. They are often, in many towns and cities around the country, they're the, they're the largest employer. They're the most profitable business. Um, they're seen as these great charitable institutions, and rightly so. I mean, they do cure the sick. The fact that even though they're charities and even though the annual charity dinner might account for one half of 1% of their revenue while they're charging $77 for a box of gauze pads <laughs> is sort of beside the point. But they are, they do have a political stature in town that is something. So a lot of the reforms we're talking about, you know, cutting costs, it goes back to the real issue of money in politics. And uh, why did Obamacare really pass, um, in addition to the skills of people like Nancy Ann, is that uh, all the most important powers that be in Washington benefited from it. I mean, what a deal. The government is going to give a tens of millions of people money to buy health insurance from private health insurance companies so that they can pay the same hospitals and the same drug companies and the same device makers that they've been paying at the same ridiculously high prices before, only there are now all these new customers. That's a reform every lobbyist can love. It now, sounds so easy when you talk about it. It wasn't no, that no, easy. No, 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 I, <laughs> Let me you're tell right. You, no, no, I, I give you tremendous credit I think for navigating your way through that. No, I, but I, I think, don't mean I think to you're really way easy. too cynical about this. I think they're, you know, I'm. The image that came into my head was Speaker Pelosi. And you know, if we had a chart here, we could, we could outline all the differences between the House bill and the Senate bill. Right. You've and mentioned she, a couple. And she had to you know, figure out how to lead her caucus to support a bill that didn't have a public right, plan. Right. That didn't, yeah, that had every reporter very different, had a yeah. list of those blue dog right. Democrats who right. were no longer in well, office. No, no, she and had what blue dog Democrats who liked it, but others single, didn't. But, why did the result? But it wasn't just come because out. you know hospitals who also took major reductions and who are having who their their cheese was moved big time in this law. They have had to change in many cases the way they do business. 
I'm not well, defending. If the, you look at the stock prices of the for-profit hospitals, they've uh, done that well. That would be a surprising statement. They've done well. They've, they've done, done well. Better, not but, well. Better. But that isn't why Henry Waxman voted for health reform. No, he of voted for not. it because and he spent not, his be, career trying to help people get well, coverage and more quality care. Obviously, you can speak for He did care. it because more people were getting coverage. It is, a, you know, net net. It is a terrific thing. Nobody denies it. But what I'm saying is, what you and your colleagues did was you found a way to do that, which is frankly what, what Mitt Romney and Ted Kennedy did in Massachusetts. They, they found a way to get coverage, and the way they found to get coverage at the end of the end of the day was they said, let's punt on costs and let's get people covered and we'll deal with costs later. But we did not punt on costs, Stephen. That's the no. point I'm making. You for everyone in this audience who works with a health care provider or a health care company, they will tell you they have had to change some things. They have had to, they've had to become more efficient. They've had to cut their administrative costs. Um, so Wall Street and, just And is, by the way, we didn't add to the deficit. We, we brought spending down. Right. No, that's, spending that's down. true because so, taxes went up. I mean, one of the really artful things was there is a tax on the wealthy that most wealthy people just didn't even you know, skip a beat of it because instead of raising the rates on income tax, they added this, you know, as you know, you know uh, this Medicare tax for all kinds of things, which I actually think is a great thing. But, uh, but you know, let's call a spade a spade. If you just, you know, all of Wall Street can't be wrong. The fact that the stocks of the insurance companies are up, the drug companies are up, the device makers are way up, even though they scream about the 3% tax, which is just, nonsense to be screaming about that. Every single player in the industry is doing better. Now, I don't begrudge that, but I'm just saying that would lead one to suspect maybe the law really doesn't clamp down on them. Well, I disagree. <laughs> okay. I think well, the evidence, I understand you're questioning as a journalist, but the evidence is to the contrary. Well, I think we could, we could go on here for the rest of the hour, but yes, I think I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, Congressman Waxman, your name has come up several times. Is there something you'd like to add to this? And wait for a microphone coming to you. Tell us about the cave-in on uh, biologics. <laughs> well, well, in yesterday's panel, I did say that pharma got too good a deal. But there was no way to have health care coverage expanded for those who couldn't get insurance without paying for the services. And therefore, the stocks went up because these uh, providers were, were getting more money for it. But we did put a lot of cost containment in there. In fact, the, the, the medical loss ratio on insurance companies kept the insurance companies from having that huge amount that uh, was unaccountable, including the high salaries that they were paying executives. So we said, you can have uh, expenses, but no more than 15%. Medicare, for example, you could attack as giving a lot of money to health care providers, but Medicare just doesn't just give money. Medicare negotiates and says, it negotiates. Medicare sets the prices. And when we were debating this issue, providers kept on saying to me, why did you go to a single payer? Why didn't you go to Medicare? I'd rather deal with Medicare than the private insurance companies. But even if we adopted a Medicare for everyone, we'd be paying money for services for people who couldn't get access to it in the past. Now, the other thing I want to say since I've got the microphone, <laughs> I always thought there was this meeting among Republicans right after Obama became president that they That's were the going meeting. to be against everything. And you said they weren't against the stimulus bill. They were against the stimulus bill. After all, they had just left the economy in a huge hole. People were thinking that we were going to go over a cliff into a new depression. Republican and Democratic economists were saying we needed a stimulus bill. We didn't get a single Republican in the House to vote for the stimulus bill. In the Senate, where they needed 60 votes, which is another issue as important as campaign money in campaigns, where you needed 60, we didn't have 60 Democrats. So we needed some Republicans. And we had the two senators from Maine and Senator... Uh, Spectre. Specter from Pennsylvania. So when President Obama was trying to do his stimulus bill, since he had those three people willing to go for the legislation, only on their terms, the president had to agree to their terms. 
So it was a, low, a smaller stimulus bill. And money was put into NIH, which was great, but that wasn't really a stimulus for the economy. And a lot of other things were put in simply because three senators wanted it. What happened to those three senator, senators? Uh, I don't know about the two women from Maine. They're able to take care of themselves. Although Senator Specter was told, you're up next time around. If you win, you're not going to be a chairman of a committee as a Republican. And you may well find yourself in a primary fight. So you had to switch parties. Well, you, know, you take a hostage. And you beat them up. That's a good message for everybody else. And then you never saw another Republican come along. And Senator Snow wanted to be there. It seemed so obvious she wanted to be there. And she even voted for it out of committee. committee yes. And then she recognized, why does she want to put herself in a, in a perilous outcast position? That's why we haven't had bipartisanship. The Republicans would hammer on their own people if they showed any deviation. I was uh, amazed at Senator Frist yesterday because he kept on saying he agreed with things, but then backed away to give the Republican slant. Well, <laughs> why? Why can't you just say, I agree with this policy, I don't agree with that policy? The, the spin. So anyway, I, I'm obviously now part of the panel, but I, 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 you forgive me. Come on up, Peter. But, uh, Come on. We'll get you the, 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 You're not a lot, but you actually know too much. Yeah. <laughs> That's but it was a tough, tough fight. And I'm reminded of one story. I had a fight in my career that went on for 10 years on the Clean Air Act, where the chairman of my committee, who was a Democrat, was lined up with the Republicans and the Reagan administration to gut the law. And we had to fight that bill and stop it. And it seemed impossible, but we were able to stop it. And then we had to try to get a better bill, and it went on and on and on. Finally, in 1990, on a bipartisan basis, with President George H.W. Bush, we passed a very good, strong bill. And a reporter, if we're going to beat up on reporters, said to me, well, of course you were going to pass a good bill. The American people so strongly support the environmental <laughs> point of view. There was no doubt that you were going to win. Well, there's always doubt that you could end up with the right policy, and you have to figure out where you're starting from. And where we started from was the Republicans were against us. And so we had to go for as a proposal where we could get every Democrat. And there were contortions to get every one of the 60 Democrats to get there. And I felt so sorry for everybody in the administration that had to deal with those personalities. And that was just on the Democratic side. So I think, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that this was a great accomplishment. The administration worked very hard. There are built-in efforts to change the health care system and hold down costs. But don't think that when we start from a system that, ex that exists, that's already the most expensive system in the world for health care, that we're suddenly going to squeeze it down. We have to control it in the future. You start where you, where you are, and you do the best you can. OK. Question in the back. Oops. Wait for microphone, please. Thank you. No, I think the guy's standing up first, and then. <laughs> So I, I, don't want to, I don't want to relitigate history. I'm Dan Ovati, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Nancy Ann, I just want to ask you a question. Um, and I've asked this to other people before, but not in this setting. Why didn't Wyden Bennett get brought up right from the beginning? You had a bill, vanilla ice cream right off the shelf, and put the Republicans right on the spot. Why, and I understand the conflict between Baucus and Wyden, and, but we had a good bill there that had bipartisan support it probably wasn't going to work anyway. But why didn't that get argued as opposed to Romney care? Well, it had, it had one Democrat and several Republicans, I think, as I recall, who supported it. Were there other Democrats? Uh, because I don't think. No. The, Julie, Julie can correct yeah, me on I this. Think, I, I, think mean, it was, I don't think there were other Democrats. I think other it was than six Senator and six. And, I, and no, I was so pretty even. I'm not the though? Senate Majority Leader, uh, but uh, Senator Reid. Uh, the leader did not think that it could pass the Senate, and it didn't have support among other Democrats. So, yeah, I was, and, I was, and by unions, the way, let's the talk about what like it was. It, so sure. it was it was to remove the so-called tax exclusion for health care, which would would put everyone on on a footing of 
paying out of their um, after-tax dollars. Um, and many corporations opposed it, as did all the unions. Um, so it didn't seem like a winning proposition at the time. Now, you know, Senator Wyden's now the ranking member of the Finance Committee, and if Democrats uh, retake the Senate, maybe we'll get a chance to see uh, what he would do with it. Yeah, I was say, well, I, and I obviously I covered Wyden Bennett, which was one of the many things that, that came up in the years preceding what they finally did. And I think the consensus about it was that it was probably a good idea, but that it would have been majorly disruptive to the healthcare system. And I think coming out of the Clinton effort, where it seemed that having everybody's health insurance change was what freaked people right, out, right. there was an effort this time around to just plug the holes rather than completely remake the entire healthcare system. And that was a big part of the problem with yeah, Wyden so That's by exactly then, right. That's by exactly then right. Senator Baucus had written his white paper, which uh, mm -hmm. sort of veered out of the way to say, the one thing we're not going to do is mess around with uh, the tax exclusion. Um, so, and Baucus was really running the show on the Senate side at that point. So that was pretty much a non-starter. And, and he was extremely focused on exactly what Henry talked about, counting votes. I mean, every day he would be talking about how many he could get on this or that, and he was trying to get Republican members on, and there weren't even a whole lot of Republicans who would support it, Wyden Bennett, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, uh, Darius Mozafarian, I'm a cardiologist, uh, uh, a doctor in public health, and I'm the dean of the School of Nutrition at Tufts. So having seen the system from the medical side, the public health side, and the, and the nutrition side, I agree with, uh, I think, the basic principle that this is really financial insurance reform to prevent financial catastrophe, and we're not going to dramatically change costs by tinkering within the healthcare system. We might change things around the margins, we might make it more cost effective, we might be able to get more for our dollar, but we're not going to lower the dollars. The, the only way we're going to lower the dollars is through public health, through nutrition, physical activity, and smoking outside the healthcare system. So this bill does have the you know, uh, accountable care organization model, which could lead to that. But why, why shouldn't it have then, or looking to the future, why shouldn't we have a system where for every $10 we spend on health care, we take $1 and we put it to public health? You know, the, the combined budgets of the NIH and the CDC are less than 1.5% of our spending on health care. So, so we have a huge public health crisis in this country. We don't really have a broken health care system. We had a broken health care financing system, but health care itself is pretty good. It's just expensive. We have a broken public health system. We have no public health system. So how can we address that? Well, uh, that wasn't the major thrust of this law, as you point out. But we did do some things in the law. Um, I mentioned yesterday the, the calorie counts on, on menus, which I think, at least when I see my children go into a restaurant and look at the menus, it, starting, it makes a difference with that generation. I don't, I don't know that the research on it yet shows that it will drive healthier choices, but I'm hopeful that it will. There was also a prevention and public health trust fund included in the law because members of Congress felt strongly that there should be funding along the same lines of the kind of funding NIH has for uh, funding prevention efforts and public health efforts in the states. And it's a $10 billion, a billion dollars a year going into that. It's not nearly enough, but again, it's going in the right direction as opposed to ignoring the problem. And hopefully it's having uh, an impact in some of the, the states that you're operating in, starting to, uh, there have been projects about obesity, projects about tobacco cessation. You know, I think we're making some progress there. It's not enough. One thing that excites me about the announcement that the Aspen uh, uh, Institute made yesterday about a new Aspen study group on health uh, is that I hope it can take on some of these questions. Uh, I think Aspen is uniquely situated to bring people together like you and others in this room to figure out how do we now deal with that piece of this that is so important in both people living healthier lives and in bringing down costs over the long run. Well, I, I think I disagree a little bit with the premise of your question. I do think there are things we can do beyond investing in public health, which obviously is um, a big factor, to bring uh, costs down that uh, that Obamacare wasn't able to include, that fixes and amendments and improvements over the next few years now that the court stuff is out of the way might do. The one that comes to mind that um, is, is probably going to get Congressman Waxman all upset is 
um, is tort reform. Um, Harry Reid said that he is not going to put any bill on the floor of the Senate that in any way does anything serious about malpractice tort reform. And that's because uh, the trial lawyers are to the Democratic Party what the, I guess the NRA is to the Republican Party, though the NRA is actually that now to the Democratic Party too. Uh, but, but you get the point. Um, the trial lawyers are big supporters of the Democratic Party. There was um, the economic side of the White House. Uh, Nancy Ann was on uh, the policy side. The economics team, uh, Larry Summers and Peter Orzek, kept trying to sneak tort reform things in, and they kept taking it out because Harry Reid wouldn't allow it. Uh, the Senate wouldn't allow it. Um, the significance of tort reform isn't necessarily on your malpractice premium. It's on the fact that uh, that doctors in emergency rooms and elsewhere have either the reason or the excuse, you can take your pick, to over-test. Um, if you go into an emergency room in this country and use the word head, as in I have a headache, I fell on my head, even I have to head to the men's room, um, <laughs> you're getting a CAT scan for sure. You just are. Um, and that's why in this country we use CAT scans and MRIs at three times the rate that we do in any other country. Uh, the cost is three times as much. And again, our results aren't any better. So tort reform is one thing that could have nipped away at the margins, maybe two or three percent of overall costs. There are lots of other things, most obviously dealing with our pharmaceutical prices, um, which were not dealt with in the act. I think there may be a crisis coming. We can thank um, the makers of the hepatitis C drug, uh, Salvati, which decided to charge $1,000 for each pill. Um, and Sarah has written a ton of stuff about this. One of her great statistics was that um, the cost to California of paying for that hepatitis C drug will equal, I think, their entire cost of what the state spends on K-12 education. Did I get that right? So just think about that. Now, the reason that's a good thing is by setting the price at $1,000 instead of $989.26 or $1,013.10, they told us all what the state of uh, regulation of pharmacy prices in this country is, which is it's non-existent. These guys didn't even bother to make up a price that made it seem like they cared about costs. They just said, hell, let's just charge $1,000. Let's see what happens. And, and, and what's happened so far is in the there, private sector, some of the insurers yeah. and some of the Medicaid it's agencies now, are saying there's starting no. to be a reaction right. to that. And that may be a hopeful sign. All right, well, that's, uh, we could go on for an hour on drug prices, too, <laughs> but I think let's take one up front. Wait for the microphone. So I'm going to ask a very simple question. David Sklar from Academic Medicine. What happens if we get a Republican president and we have Republican House and Senate? What happens to the Affordable Care Act? I don't think anything. I don't why, either. Why not? <laughs> well, because by then you'll have you know, upwards of 20 million people covered. Um, people who get coverage like it. They want to stay covered. Uh, I just don't see them upending it. Yeah, plus Congressman Waxman's going to love that 60 vote thing in the Senate that he just uh, I was critical of. Yeah, but is there, I mean, at some point, you know, this is, I've been doing this for 28 years now, uh, and every time a big major bill passes, you have something called technical corrections, as you talked about yesterday, because no bill um, is perfect, mm -hmm. or it doesn't play out the way people assume it will. And so, I mean, Medicare is, has been a series of technical corrections Hundreds over the years. Of, yeah. um, and, you know, in 1972, seven years after Medicare, there was an enormous expansion of the program. Um, that, was one of the, that was one of the most important uh, health care bills ever um, that people, I think, forget about, um, created as a, the SSI program, among other things. Um, at some point, aren't the Republicans going to have to take a whack sure. at cleaning up some of the things that should yeah, be fixed? Yeah, I think at some point, you know, maybe I actually had some hope that on the SGR bill that passed, they might put some things together. They, they weren't able to do that. But yes, I think there will be um, an effort to go back and tweak some of the things and, and, uh, and start working on it together. And if I were a Republican president, I would thank my lucky stars that the problem of the uninsured that had been hanging out there for 100 years, some of these other problems had been dealt with, and then move on to 
you know, improving it, making it better. It depends what they run on, of course. But <laughs> yeah, you know, if they I, run on I, repealing it, then they sort of have to do something. They have to do, but I, I just, I think it really is here to say, you know, we've given a lot of people, a lot of people, something very important, not just the subsidies, but as Nancy Ann mentioned, everybody now lives in a state of consciousness where they know that if they're sick, they can't get thrown off their insurance or they can get new insurance. Um, how do you sell that politically if you're repealing it unless you're doing something to, to preserve that? And as we found with Obamacare, it's really hard to preserve that without this complex scheme that is Obamacare. The president used to make this motion, Rubik's Cube, and it is, it's a Rubik's Cube. And so, again, if I were a Republican president, I would be happy I didn't have to try to spin the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> I'd want to work on a different, different game. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Cliff. I'm a senior editor at Vox. Um, my what happened to your foot? Oh, um, had no. an incident with Michael Cannon. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a boring stress fracture. Running down the Supreme Court steps. Yeah, you know, but I made it here. Um, my question, I think it's mostly for Nancy Ann, but probably all three of you could take a crack at it, is I think the White House obviously gets dinged for their messaging on the Affordable Care Act, that it wasn't explained well, people don't understand it, and I don't think all that is really warranted, but I was hoping maybe, Nancy Ann, you could talk a little bit about, you know, in this, like, 2011 to 2013 period, like what were the challenges you all faced with messaging the ACA? What were the hard things about talking to the public? Kind of how did you decide on your approach? And Julie and Steve, you might have also have some thoughts on that from the reporting you've done on it. Well, during the time I was really involved in it up until early um, 2011, when we were beginning the implementation, um, we, what we tried to talk about were the positive changes that were coming in the insurance markets. And Stephen mentioned that, the, the dealing with the pre-existing condition exclusions, dealing with the fact that children could stay on your plan until you're um, age 26. But nothing seemed to move the needle. It doesn't uh, make the law more popular. And I wish I, uh, we were told no PowerPoint, but if I, had, if I could put up one slide, uh, Bob Blinden at uh, Harvard, uh, who does work for the Kaiser Family Foundation, has done some analysis of the um, advertising that's been spent uh, since the law passed. And it's, you know, a, a, a bar graph where one side goes up to the very top of the page and it's hundreds of millions of dollars that have been spent um, against the, you know, messaging against the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, and how much has been spent on the positive side, which is a tiny little sliver. You know, and that stuff works. And I'm not sure what we could have done to combat that. And we did see that when the president got out there talking about it, it probably made it more popular among the people who already supported it, but it ne didn't necessarily change the, uh, you know, the overall popularity of the law. What's going to change the popularity of the law is people uh, seeing the benefits that it's producing. And one of the more interesting uh, surveys I've seen recently is one that J.D. Power and Associates did, uh, where they're just looking at what do consumers say, and the people who have the plans and the exchanges and the marketplaces uh, not only like them, uh, the approval ratings of those are higher than of employer-sponsored insurance. So it just leads me to believe that over time, it could be 10 years, it could be longer, uh, it will become more popular. I think the biggest uh, mistake is something I alluded to, which is um, not emphasizing enough uh, the low cost uh, because the, the administration was just gun-shy and, and, you know, Democrats, as a general matter, I think have become gun shy about saying, hey, we're doing an income redistribution program. That's a dirty word. This is a massive re um, income re uh, redistribution program. There are more people, um, they were projected, if the states had all expanded Medicaid, more people would have been the beneficiaries of the expansion of Medicaid than were on welfare when Ronald Reagan ran against welfare in 1980. I mean, this, this is a big income redistribution program, and I think the Democrats were gun-shy about it. The last point I want to make is I think there has been in the Obama administration sort of a general paranoia about talking to the press. Um, I'll venture to say that you didn't give any or not more than a handful of on-the-record interviews to people. 
and I found when I was doing my reporting that even something I like... I had one with her. I was going to say, I okay. seem to remember, we, and during the period when we were well, first just implementing the law, though, we did quite a few well, every time we put it was out a all about, Right, but it was all about you know, the insurance stuff. During, um, just as a general matter, I would get these emails from uh, the press office at HHS or at you know, CMS saying, background only, we're having a briefing at 2 o'clock. Even that had to be on background. I remember going to interview uh, uh, the CMS head, uh, Marilyn Tavner, and I sat down to interview her, and her press person said, oh, by the way, this is on background. And I just got up and walked out of the room, and she said, where are you going? And I said, why would anyone interview the person who dispenses more money out of the Treasury than any single government official? Who would do that interview on background? And she said, oh, I don't know. And she sat down and did it on the record. Um, so I think that all administrations are that way, certainly you know, with White House staff people, but the Obama administration had a really good story to tell here, and they just didn't do a terrific job of telling it, and it's much more effective if you tell it on the record with your name attached to it. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the on-the-record the on the <laughs> interview I had with Nancy was about the messaging and the not was. great job they were yes. doing about it. I think we have time for one more question, if we make it quick, right over here. Wait for the microphone, it's right behind you. Hi, uh, it's a relatively quick question. I just want to take a minute to uh, bring, bring it back to humanizing uh, healthcare and the Affordable Care Act. My name is Erica Chain, and I'm a product of our system working. Um, my life was saved by the Affordable Care Act. I was diagnosed with a life-threatening brain tumor. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, while volunteering overseas, when I came back, I was medically uninsurable due to a pre-existing condition. Through the ACA, I was able to get health insurance through the pre-existing condition insurance plan, saved my life. I got the access to the life-saving brain surgery I needed, all the rehab, I've recovered 100%, now working to transform the healthcare system and turn my negative into a positive. So I wanna say thank you, first of all. And then the, the question is, how are we tracking these successes? And how are we giving this feedback loop to the patients? And you know, there's real change in this, and like you said, the messaging wasn't clear. The largest misconception is that I, I got a free ride. You know, I racked up 1.3 million in um, medical debt. Because I had health insurance, though, I, I don't owe that 1.3 million. I'm working, I'm a contributing member of society, um, fully recovered, and that, you know, that's what this was meant to do. And thank you for sharing that. And the the pre-existing condition insurance program was the program that was set up by the Congress to start right after the law passed to help people who, like you, who couldn't, <coughs> couldn't get insured in many states because they banned, they had a, a pre-existing exclusion ban. So um, thank you for sharing that because it really does bring it back home to what the president was trying to do. And stories like yours, are, Eric, are what kept him going during this, and he would ask me, what about, I won't name the person's name because she's since passed away, but there's a woman he met um, in Iowa who um, had had breast cancer and um, had coverage, but it had a lifetime limit, so she'd gone beyond that, and she was really worried about what was gonna happen to her family. Um, and I just recently learned that she had passed away, but you know, those are the stories that kept him going, those are the stories that kept some of the other people in this room who worked on the law going. And as far as tracking them, uh, people send their stories into the White House, and I know that from time to time they will publish some of them. When I left the White House, the President gave me a book that had letters that had been written to him by people. Um, it is important to remember how this law has helped people. Thank you. Last word. We're over time, so real quick. Good. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs>